Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT makes a difference in our students' futures, Valley Bank, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future, the Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. Suez North America, dedicated to shaping a sustainable environment. Fedway Associates, Inc. And by IBEW Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Hi, this is Steve Adubato. Welcome to Think Tank here on News 12 Plus. As always, my colleague, the senior producer of Think Tank, Nicole Swinerton. How are we doing, Nicole? We're doing great. How about you? Doing great. Let's set up this show first with U.S. Senator Cory Booker. And on the back half, we have Republican Assembly Leader John Bramnick. What did you take away from the Booker interview? It was a fascinating interview. Cory, uh, Senator Booker really talks about you going on the first name basis with Senator <laughs> I wish Booker. I could. I wish I could. <laughs> um, he talks a, a lot about the role of the federal government in, in helping everybody through this COVID crisis and beyond. One other big takeaway I would say is um, uh, Senator Booker talks about the legislation that he's working on uh, with Senator Menendez about Judge Salas, which we know is the uh, tragedy that happened here in New Jersey to protect judges. So I think that's a, a fascinating part of the interview. Yeah, the other thing, real quick, that you'll see in the Cory Booker interview, and by the way, he does like being called Cory by all kinds of people. He's very um, informal that way, is he talks extensively about Kamala Harris, his colleague in the Senate. Um, again, this will be seen before the election, maybe after. We don't know whether she'll be the vice president or not. But he talks a lot about that. But the John Bramnick interview, fascinating. He was very critical of President Trump, continues to be, even though Bramnick's a Republican, critical of the president's tone and the way he handles himself in public situations, the nastiness, um, but also critical of Governor Murphy saying, hey, you got to open things up. Absolutely. I mean, there are a bunch of different sides here, but I think it was interesting to see that um, Assemblyman Bramnick is critical of President Trump, but at the same time, um, he's critical of Governor Murphy, and as we know, a Republican and a Democrat. So you can see that there's there's so many different sides to every issue here that we're seeing throughout this crisis. And by the way, as Nicole knows, as the senior producer of Think Tank, that's why we created this show, so that people can have their voices heard. We have no point of view. This is not fake news. It's meaningful conversations. Hey, Nicole, there would be no Think Tank if it were not for our underwriters. Want to thank some of them? Absolutely. So thanks so much to Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, NJIT, and PSENG. Absolutely. And a whole range of other funders that you'll see identified right on the screen. And uh, good stuff. So without further ado, Think Tank. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to a very compelling program um, that kicks off with United States Senator Cory Booker. Senator, good to see you. Good to see you. Always great to see you, man. Uh, I hope you and your family are well during this uh, pandemic. Same to you and yours. Um, Senator, I want to start off with a very difficult um, but important topic. Um, Judge Esther Salas, who you know well, a horrific tragedy that happened um, in which her son Daniel, 20 years of age, was, was killed, was murdered. Her husband was shot by someone who, um, an intruder in their home. You and Senator Menendez have legislation dealing directly with protecting federal judges. I spoke to the former chief uh, of the judiciary here, U.S. Chief uh, Jose Linares, and, and he told me that judges are vulnerable. You know this is true. What is that legislation and why does it matter? Well, first of all, um, I've talked to the judge, and this was a horrific tragedy that shook not only our state, but um, I heard from jurists all, all across the country. 
uh, and the grief uh, that's pouring out for someone to be so viciously targeted and uh, at their own home. And she made the direct appeal. I, I talked to her, Senator Menendez has, and the both of us feel like we've got to make uh, our judges safer and really all the people that work in our federal courthouses. So he and I have had conversations across the aisle and we're looking at a number of different measures uh, from uh, considering things we could do on the internet to protect judges' personal information all the way uh, to just their physical safety at their places of work and at their residency. So I'm grateful uh, for always my partner, Bob Menendez, and we're gonna get something done on this. Uh, we feel uh, a real sense of conviction, both personally, as well as in our roles as uh, New Jersey senators. Thank you, Senator. Um, switch gears, COVID-19. We are taping on the 13th of August. Where are we, where do we need to be, and why aren't we where we need to be? Well, I, I think it's very painful to see how much of an outlier the United States of America is compared to our peers around the globe. New Zealand has gone now, I think, over 100 days without even a case. Uh, the nations that had the virus at the same time in us, like Taiwan, for example, only have, uh, have less than 10 people dead. We have made a lot of bad mistakes, especially at the national level, by not coming up with a rapid plan. And now, at a time that the pandemic is ticking up the number of cases, we are still failing to see the kind of federal action. And we have an impasse in Congress uh, that's just unacceptable. Uh, this is one of the this is the biggest crisis of our lifetime, and it demands a big response. And so we are pushing down in Washington. Unfortunately, Mitch McConnell does not want to seem to move seem to want to move forward on uh, the kind of funding we need to have a national system of rapid testing, rapid results, contact tracing, the kind of things that have helped other countries get through this. Uh, the resources we need for our school system, for state and local governments whose expenditures have been going up to protect citizens, revenues going down. New Jersey towns are in crisis right now. Uh, there are a lot of things that we need to get funding for that we're fighting. Uh, but right now we have a block coming from the White House and Mitch McConnell. And so this is going to be a tough uh, a battle over these next coming weeks, uh, because not only do we have a health crisis, we also have an economic crisis. Families all around the state of New Jersey are hurting right now. Our unemployment rate is still in the double digits. And we are seeing uh, those who are living paycheck to paycheck now facing potentially a tsunami of a eviction crisis on top of that. And the food insecurities, I talked to the leaders of all of New Jersey's food banks, the stories they are talking about, about the demand uh, and, and, and the challenges they're facing are really painful uh, when, when you see how much uh, New Jerseyans now are having to turn to our food banks. So this is not a time for half measures and I'm gonna do everything I can uh, to get through this log jam and deliver resources, critical resources to our state. Real quick follow up folks, uh, go on steveautobato.org, the website will be up there. Look at the recent interview we did with Carlos Rodriguez of the Community Food Bank of New Jersey to expand upon what the Senator said. Senator, uh, we're doing a series called Confronting Racism. Yes, the graphic will be up as I describe it, but way more important than the graphic, it's an ongoing commitment that we have made. We should have done more earlier, frankly, but the last time I talked to you, a big part of that conversation was your efforts around criminal justice. That's a piece of quote unquote confronting racism. Other top priorities in this moment that we have to make real progress, what are they? Well, first, Steve, I, I just want to acknowledge you and your family have been a, a way ahead of the curve. And I just want to recognize uh, what your dad has done uh, here in, uh, in New Jersey for uh, Black and Latino kids uh, is extraordinary. And that's the kind of commitment we need now uh, is people uh, fighting because making sure we have more equity and inclusion is not just a, something for black and brown kids. It actually makes our entire economy, our entire nation so much stronger. So as your senator, I've been working on these issues since uh, New Jersey uh, about six years ago sent me down to Washington and delivered results. So we've taken on mass incarceration in a bipartisan manner, liberated thousands of people, so many New Jerseyans who were unjustly uh, incarcerated. Uh, we've tried to take on uh, investment in uh, uh, urban communities and was able to pass something that even the president hailed, the Opportunity Zones, uh, I remember. driving a lot of money into uh, an investment back into our urban communities. Uh, but we need to do much more than that. And one of them 
is the act that I authored in the Senate with Kamala Harris, which is the Justice and Policing Act to create greater levels of transparency and accountability. This is not a partisan stand that we have. It's actually pieces of our bill have now been adopted in states from Colorado to Iowa in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have a real access to health care, uh, and as we're seeing in this pandemic being laid bare, uh, not only uh, deaths overall, but particularly higher rates of, of death in uh, black and brown communities. So there's a lot of work we have to do, both here in New Jersey and nationally, to really make our nation live up to its promise and its ideals uh, to really be a nation of liberty and justice for all. Senator, you mentioned your colleague uh, Kamala Harris, Senator Harris. She is the vice presidential and uh, choice of Joe Biden, presidential candidate Joe Biden. What is it that everyone watching right now, what do they know, what should they know, excuse me, what should they know about Senator Harris that in your view would make her a very strong vice president? Well, I, I've, I've had the blessed position, thanks to New Jersey, uh, to, to uh, be able to develop a real friendship with both uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And Kamala is more than a friend. I mean, she's a sister to me. We have, uh, you know, really been in the trenches together, working together on a host of issues. Uh, she and I were co-authors of the anti-lynching legislation, criminal right. justice reform, even two states that rely heavily on mass transit and infrastructure. We fought for and won big grants uh, to a key uh, mass transit system. So folks should just know, irrespective of race and gender, she is an extraordinary leader uh, that in the, in the uh, sort of in the room where it happens, uh, gets things done. And then you add to that the fact that this is an epic, uh, history-changing moment where you have an African-American woman of Indian descent uh, uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, those are two populations that bring a lot of pride to our state, our Indian Americans in New Jersey and our Black Americans. It, it is this wonderful moment where all of us, regardless of your party, <laughs> should just take pride in now seeing a ticket uh, in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that really uh, speak to the truth of who we are as a nation, that this is the United States of America, no matter what your background. Uh, sure, there's still challenges. Still, sure, there's still obstacles. Sure, there's still work to be done. But we still have a dream uh, that's worthy and righteous and possible. And I'm just so proud in this moment uh, to see uh, Kamala Harris ascend to this historic place on, on this Democratic ticket. Uh, as we speak, the president continues to call Senator Harris nasty. The president calling Kamala Harris nasty. You find that interesting? Uh, well, first of all, I find it so gendered. I mean, he doesn't use that word. He's he called many women that, never any men. Uh, this is uh, a person that we need to understand the truth. And I know, I know you're, I know your parents. So I know you were taught the same thing I was. Is that what you say about other people is more a reflection of who you are than who you're talking about. And Donald Trump has a meanness about him. Uh, the way he talks about others, the demeaning and the degrading language he uses, that is not just the presidency. You're not just the commander in chief. You're one of the highest moral offices in the land. And at a time that our nation needs to be celebrating and, and elevating uh, our ideals of fellowship and uh, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, at a time we need healing and be, to be brought together and recognize that the lines that divide us are not as strong as the, the ties that bind us. That's what we need right now. And unfortunately, he is just doubling down on gendered, uh, racial, uh, uh, degrading, divisive, partisan attacks. When, it, when we're in the midst of a pandemic, when we need to be calling this country together to face our common challenges and our common foes. And real quick on that, uh, uh, for those who follow the president's Twitter feed, and he, when he totes, uh, tweets about Senator Booker, he, he spells his name wrong, and it's it, Corey. Would you let everyone know how it's spelled? C O R Y, <laughs> correct? I have to Sorry. say C O R Y, but the fact that uh, not two R's, right? No, no, sir. But the fact that he's like <laughs> obsessed with me uh, must mean I'm doing something right, <laughs> because I'll, I'm um, going to leave that alone. Yeah, because uh, judge, uh, judge the body by uh, who, what, if, if, as my mom used to always tell me: if you're not being attacked or criticized, you're probably not doing anything. Uh, so well, I'm glad. Well, I get enough of it as well on this end. So, hey, real, real quick, Senator, um, there's an initiative called Reimagine Child Care. It's a, a follow-up to a long-term long -term series we've been doing 
called Right from the Start NJ. It's all about child care, quality, affordable child care, more important than ever. Uh, it, it is really one of those um, pivotal issues that affects so much of our well-being as a country, from our, our, our economic well-being uh, uh, to our children's uh, uh, success and well-being. And we are such an outlier in the, on the planet's industrial nations that we do not have high quality, affordable child care for all. So many families find themselves in this bind because in most states in America, quality child care is more expensive uh, than uh, college tuition at your local state uh, universities. And so I, I just can't tell you how offensive the reality is and how many Americans are, especially in this pandemic, caught in a trap where they are uh, being told to go back to work, uh, but yet their children aren't necessarily in school full time and they can't find childcare. It is really a distraught present we live in. So the urgency is now. That's why I am partnered on legislation to make it a federal support uh, for states and efforts uh, to have a national system uh, that, that helps to fund the highest quality childcare because that's what's gonna make us competitive globally. And that's what's gonna give our children the right start they all should need for success. You've been listening to and watching United States Senator Cory Booker. Um, Senator, I want to thank you so much for once again joining us, and we wish you and your family all the best in these challenging times. Thank you, Senator. Steve, thank you always. Thanks for your, for your this is being one of the great voices of New Jersey and helping people have the information they need uh, in, in a challenging time. So I'm grateful. Thanks. I'll make sure we don't edit that out. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Senator. <laughs> all the best. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. We're now joined by John Ramnick, who is the leader of the Republican Party in the state assembly, otherwise known as the minority leader in the assembly. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, Steve. Thanks for having me on. We're uh, taping on the 4th of August. We're in the middle of a storm right now. Hopefully the power will stay on. We'll have this conversation. Speaking of power, watch this awkward transition. Um, let's get right into Governor Murphy, then we'll talk about President Trump in a second. Sure. How would you rate or describe the governor's leadership uh, and the way he's utilizing his executive power in the midst of COVID-19 as, as to where we are right now? Well, it's up and down. My main concern is that it's not as transparent as I think it should be. I think Senator Loretta Weinberg came out, had some concerns about where he gets his numbers. Steve Sweeney, the Democratic Senate president, said it. I said, why not have hearings on these issues? Why just go back to a back room, come out and make announcements? Look, some of these decisions are good decisions, but people get frustrated because they don't hear the debate. They don't, there's no transparency. That's an important part of leadership. And it's been four months in a state of emergency. You know, it's time for the public to hear the debate. Well, by the way, when this is seen, it may be more than four months, five months, close to even a six. But respectfully, devil's advocate, Assemblyman Bramnick, isn't it fair to say that in this situation, in this pandemic, that the governor has to make quick decisions and based on the information at the time, and you don't have the ability to have the legislative process and the legislature weigh in and hearings that it's just a totally different time, and therefore the status quo won't work. You don't need the legislature because he, he's already said a state of emergency, so you don't need legislation, but you can have a panel discussion. But Who's why hearings to make an executive decision? Well, the question becomes, have the restaurant owners have an opportunity to be heard in front of the public? Epidemiologists, multiple doctors haven't been heard. People who run restaurants, uh, inside and outside have not been heard. So the bottom line is have hearings and then after the public debate, say I heard both sides, now here's my decision. And don't tell me there's not enough time for that because you got to you can do this 24 hours a day, have hearings. We've had hearings on things that are half as important. I just think the transparency has been bad. 
I think this virus is bad. I believe in the medicine. I'm not saying this isn't serious. I just think I want to hear from everybody in a public debate. And the Democrats say the same thing. You've always been out spoken. You're always, uh, your reputation is as someone who works with the quote other side of the aisle as a Republican, working with Democrats. But at the same time, where we are right now, and again, this will be seen later, the transmission rate is going up in New Jersey. There are more cases. There is a problem here. Yes, in other parts of the country, as we do this program, it's worse. But aren't you worried that if we open up, as Governor Chris Christie, who you were very supportive of, said recently on, on, on the series, hey, it's time to open up. Would you not have that point of view, given the fact that the numbers are going up as we do the program? This reminds me of every other debate in the world. Everyone is an extremist. Open up, don't open up. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is a middle ground. People need to hear and have an opportunity to be heard. And people should not be frustrated because they don't have a voice. At least when, when people are heard, they can accept the decision. The bottom line is, I'm concerned about the virus. We need to limit it. But I'm going to tell you, it's very hard to lock down a society. So that's why you need public support. You need a constituency. You need transparency. Well, the last time you were in the studio with us, um at NJTV, we were talking about President Trump. And you, again, have never held back on stating that the lack of civility, not just in politics overall, but also particularly in Washington, that the president has contributed to it. Let me ask you this. How would you rate the president beyond the civil discourse or the lack of it, which we'll talk about in a moment, how would you rate the president's leadership and his performance um, from a national level on COVID-19? Terrible. Uh, just terrible. I mean, one day he says one thing, one day he says the other thing. And I think the polls show that. And I'm worried because if you have a Republican president who doesn't lead, at least take a position. If you want open society and you're consistently in favor of open society, maybe people go along. I disagree with that. I think you need some restrictions with respect to COVID. But to go back and forth, it hurts us as Republicans in the state of New Jersey. Uh, look, just because I'm a Republican doesn't mean I'm in a cult. If somebody does something, in my judgment, that I think is wrong or improper, and the person happens to be a Republican, what should I say? I'm not going to say anything because I'm a Republican? That's not how it works anymore. It used to be. Look how this president has criticized every, almost every prior Republican president has gone after Bush. He's gone after Senator McCain. He's gone after Marco Rubio. He even attacked Chris Christie. If he's allowed to attack people, he's allowed to disagree, or should I say, call names. It's not disagree. He also does it with his own, with his own public health professionals. As we right. do this program, so, so, whether it's Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks, again, things may change, but publicly critical of his own leaders in the area of public health. That's why I say it's terrible. And, you know, my concern is this. I'm concerned about the Republican Party in New Jersey because if the image is somebody meets me and they go, you're a Republican. Oh, you must be Trump. Look, uh, that's not the way the world works. Just because you're a Democrat, you're a former assembly person. That doesn't mean you're like every other Democrat. I start out arguing for civility. I'll continue to do that. And I'm concerned about that. Now, that doesn't mean I like the left wing of your party, of the Democratic Party. I That's think, not my party, Assemblyman. I'm sorry. used to be your party. I'm sorry. Yeah, you tell you, you're referring to my very undistinguished one term in the legislature back in the day, but go ahead. Everything you do is distinguished. You can see, look at how you look. Um, so the, the, the bottom line here is I'm deeply concerned about this wildly left part of the Democratic Party. That's why I'm frustrated, because when I see a president uh, who's a Republican and he gets into fights with everybody, I don't see how that's helpful. I don't get it. I don't think New Jersey, look, New Jersey is the purple state. And if we, if we find out that this president, okay, gets everybody upset at him, that's not helpful. Simple so let me that. ask you this. Senator, I want to follow up on something. By the way, if you're listening on the audio side, this is State Assemblyman John Bramack, the leader of, of the Republicans in the state Assembly, um, you actually texted me offline. We had a conversation offline about um, the late, great, iconic Congressman John Lewis. His funeral, I believe it, Barack Obama had just finished speaking, and you and I had a conversation offline, and um, President Bush was there, President Clinton was there. John Lewis' track record speaks for itself 
um, as a civil rights leader, as a member of Congress. The president, President Trump, chose not to be there. It bothered you. Well, President Trump, I heard him react. So he said that John Lewis didn't come to his inauguration, uh, didn't come to speeches, and therefore he wasn't going to go to the funeral. Look, when former presidents go from across the aisle, I believe that former presidents uh, should all go because it sends a message. The current president, the current yes. president. And here's why. You've got to, in politics, you cannot take this stuff personally. Do you realize that if I took things personally, I wouldn't be able to meet with the leadership of the Democratic Party. I wouldn't be able to meet with Murphy. I wouldn't even be able to meet with Chris Christie, okay? Because at some point in time, someone does something to you. My father said, if you look too closely at all your friends, you won't have any friends, right? We have to get way above the personal issues the statement, somebody didn't introduce me right, someone didn't come to my a fundraiser, didn't some, someone didn't come to my, when I won this last election. No, it's not about me, it's not about President Trump, it's about public policy, Americans and New Jerseyans, and you gotta get above it, get over it, okay? So what message did President Trump send by not going to Congressman John Lewis's funeral? He took, John Lewis is uh, not showing up personally. We in politics don't, we cannot take things personally. So I'm saying he wasn't above the fray. You must be above the fray. You have to be bigger than that. And that's a concern to me. You gotta get, oh, you can't take this stuff personally. How can you get anything done? So in the moments we have left, I'm curious about this, uh, Simon Bramnick. You, you've been very critical of the president and his leadership, but in terms of the two-party system, what impact do you believe the president has? Because as we do this program, he said, listen, we may have to push the election. I don't trust the election. It's bogus. It blah, 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 fake news, the whole, whole bit. What if the president says, I do not accept the result? You're laughing. I do not accept the results of this election. I'm not going anywhere. Well, let me just tell you, in this country, uh, if, if he wins or loses, but assume he doesn't for a second. Well, if he I'm wins, not going anywhere. If he wins, he's staying, right? But yes. if he loses, what's going to happen is the Supreme Court will give an order that he shall be removed. And I trust the military. I trust our institutions to, to easily, at that point in time, it will be executed. The order of the Supreme Court, I guarantee you, will be executed. Should it come to that, Assemblyman Bramnick? Of course not. Of course not. But just, just let's keep, I want to leave one thing with you on this. Sure. Last time I ran, I had the Democrats on my left, and I had two guys on the right that says, I'm not Trump enough. Look, my job We ran is against not, you in a primary. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. This was the general election. Oh, in the general election. That's no, right. No, I'm they sorry. didn't want to run in the primary. So I, these people said I wasn't Trump enough on the right. On the left, they said I'm too much like <laughs> Trump. What I am for are the people of the state of New Jersey and common sense. What happened to common sense? If a president goes, I don't like the election, I'm not leaving, you sound like a big baby to me. Assemblyman John Bramnick, the leader of the Republican Party um, in the state assembly. We don't know what the future holds in New Jersey. He may be a candidate statewide down the road, but either way, well, we'll continue to have- And if I run, respectful. it's run on common sense. That's what I'm running on. I appreciate that. And also the other thing we appreciate, Assemblyman, is your accessibility to us in the media and to the civil discourse we always have. Thank you so much. All the best to you and your family, John. Thank you, Steve. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm Steve Adubato. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Valley Bank, PSE&G, the Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. Suez North America, Fedway Associates, Inc., IBEW Local 102. And by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State. And by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by ROINJ. <laughs>
for all the ordinary things in our lives. And for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever.